Hi there folks. I've prepared this video and it's designed to guide you through a Maundy Thursday or upper room meal re remembrance. It would be most effective if you prepare a few things in advance so that we can all participate together. Here's some things you're going to need. First, two candles. Any kind will be okay and they'll be lit at the very beginning before the meal starts. Those are usually lit by the wife or mother of the family, but anyone can light them. The second thing would be to prepare some things for communion. We usually use bread and grape juice, but if you don't have those exact elements in your house, feel free to substitute crackers, tortillas, even some chips, and whatever beverage that makes a good substitute with some glasses that we'll save and use those later. Also have a Bible or a device with a Bible app ready so you can read some scriptures. And this is optional, a basin or a large mixing bowl with a pitcher of water and a hand towel for hand washing. And that's especially good for families to do that. And the most important thing would be to have a great meal ready. So I doubt that you've got a, a roasted lamb there, but fix whatever you would have for, for everyone that you will enjoy. Then the rest of the video is designed to start after the meal is all ready and on the table. Everyone's gathered there, but before you start eating. So now I'm going to put a list up here in a moment. And when you see the list, just pause the video, but then get everything ready. Everyone at the table. And then before you unpause it, before you pray, before you, uh, just after you light the candles. And then go ahead and unpause this. So go ahead and pause this now. Okay, are you all there? Is everybody hungry? So you should have your meal ready to eat, and I hope it smells good. Your candles should be lit too, and your communion elements ready somewhere where you can grab them later. If not, maybe you better pause it again and start that. But if you're ready, let's go ahead and get started. One of my favorite celebrations of the year is Maundy Thursday. For several years now at Cass City Missionary Church, we have gathered for a potluck meal in a variety of ways that we've pointed to the rich messages and vivid biblical themes connected to that Thursday night of Holy Week. That is the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples to observe Passover. It's often referred to as the Last Supper. This year, because of the plague facing our nation and world, we're all forced to stay home and shelter in place. The Passover feast was designed to be a family celebration that is observed in the home, perfect for our setting. I see some similarities between Maundy Thursday 2020 and Passover as it was first observed long before the time of Christ, just before Israel was set free from centuries of slavery in Egypt. Moses had been sent by God to set Israel free, but the king of Jesus, Egypt, Pharaoh, he refused to let Israel go, so God sent a series of plagues on Egypt. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to pause the video again, and I'd like to see how many of those plagues you can recall. Now, if you uh, grew up in Sunday school, hopefully you'll be able to remember some of, some of them. If you have no idea, or you just like knowing the answers before you have to take the test, then you can open your Bibles to Exodus and scan through chapters 7 through 11, just do it quickly and see how many of the plagues you can find. Otherwise, go ahead and share them when we pause and see how many you come up with. And I will give you the list after we pause. So think about some things and discuss it too while you're paused. Here's some questions. And in a moment, I'll put this, the sign up so you can see these questions. First, talk about or think about why did God send the plagues? In what ways did God show mercy even during the plagues? And why does God allow bad things like coronavirus even now in 2020? So here's the list, and now pause and see how many plagues you can remember, and then talk about the questions. Well, let's see how many of the 10 plagues you remembered without looking. Keep track. And I think maybe you better keep track who got the most right. The first one was water turned into blood. The second was the frogs. 
The third was lice or gnats, that's all one. The fourth was the plague of flies. The fifth was the livestock that died. The sixth was boils. The seventh was hail. The eighth was locust. The ninth, ninth <laughs> was darkness. And the last one, the tenth one, was the death of the firstborn. How many did you get right? Who got the most right? They should get a prize, I think. Now, Passover itself is focused on that last plague, the death of the firstborn. God gave Israel a way to be protected from the judgment of death. And in a moment, I want you to pause the video again and read the following verses, all from the book of Exodus, second chapter in the Bible, chapter 12, and the verses are 7 through 8 and 12 through 13 and verse 23. I'll put the, the, the words up there in a minute. Then I want you to think about and discuss together, first, what did Israel have to do to be protected from the plague of death? Second, what was God looking for as he passed through the land? And third, do you think God wants to destroy people or save people? And answer, talk about why you think that. So, again, I'm going to put this up after you've done. Uh, then unpause the video and we'll continue because I bet you're getting hungry. Go ahead and pause. Now, many centuries after that first Passover, Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room to observe the Passover feast. As they ate the lamb, as they recalled the plagues that led up to God's deliverance from slavery, Jesus used that setting and those powerful and very familiar Passover symbols to point us to himself, to point us to his salvation. In every Passover, there will be many special blessings or prayers. There'll be several cups, or it's kind of like toasts to honor God. And it all begins, of course, with a ceremonial hand washing. So these days we're being told, wash your hands to prevent infection from COVID-19. It was during that hand washing part of the ceremony in the upper room where John describes how Jesus went even a step further and he washed his disciples' feet. He did this to demonstrate his extreme love for them and to set an example that they should love and serve one another just as humbly as he had served them by washing their feet. So before you eat, be sure everyone has their hands washed. And if you want to enter into the scene with Jesus and his disciples, now's the time to use that basin or big mixing bowl and a pitcher of water, and then take turns pouring water over each other's hands into the bowl, and then dry them with the towel. But here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. As, as you do that for someone else, as you wash their hands, I'd like you to tell them that you what you really appreciate about them, and thank God for them. Just put a blessing on that person whose hands you're washing. So we're all hungry, so this time when you pause the video, you can read John 13, 1 through 14, and wash your hands. After that, be sure that someone prays, thanking God for all his blessings and for your food, and then eat, <laughs> eat, enjoy. Be sure to tell some stories. Be sure to tell and have people share how they have seen God at work these past days and weeks. And someone should be able to tell a good joke or a riddle. There ought to be some laughter that we hear. Now, after you've eaten, clear the dirty things away, out of the way, and then be sure the bread and juice, the things you've prepared for communion, whatever you have available, are now on the table, ready for communion. Once that's all ready, then unpause the video again for the communion instructions. So here's the passage of scripture you can read this time. After supper... Jesus used those Passover symbols, the unleavened bread, the lamb that was sacrificed, the blood painted on the door frames to demonstrate how he can save each of us from the slavery of sin. 
The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse, starting in verse 23, describes the pattern for us to follow. First, I want to read these verses, and then we'll have you pause again and do what the verses say. We start in verse 23 and 24. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So after you pause the video, someone should again pray a prayer of thanks for Jesus and invite God's presence by his Holy Spirit into your home as you worship there around the table. Then share your bread. Maybe it's crackers or tortillas. And every everyone then go ahead and eat together in thanksgiving for Jesus. So let's pause and have you do that now. Next, Paul says in verse 25 and 26, In the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, pause again and share your cup together. If you're with someone else, I think you should clink glasses, then drink it together and remember Jesus' blood shed for us. Well, folks, I hope that was a special time. Thank you for sharing together. Right now, we're all having to shelter in place like the ancient Jews were sheltering in their homes with the blood painted on their doorways to protect them as the death angel passed through the land. Please understand, I'm not suggesting that somehow these going through these symbolic rituals is going to be like a magic protection over you to keep you from getting the virus or succumbing to it. It's God who is our protector and our healer, not some magical actions. We trust in him and we look to him to find safety and shelter. But remember, the first and foremost healing God wants to, all of us to have is healing from our sin. Sin that can lead us to eternal death. That healing, that protection comes when we shelter in place with our lives covered with Jesus' blood. Unless we're raptured when Jesus returns, all of us will have to face death eventually. But none of us needs to face eternal death. Because Jesus' blood, which he shed on the cross, covers us and protects us from God's judgment. His body was given for us, and it's the bread of life. I like what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but instead with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, without blemish or defect. Tomorrow is Good Friday. We focus on Jesus' body and blood given to us on the cross for our salvation. This year, the missionary church has called us to dedicate Good Friday tomorrow as a day of fasting and prayer. So to get more information, go to our website, castcitymc.org. When the image at the top of the page changes to the National Day of Prayer and Fasting, click on the image, and then it will take you to the information about the day and the fast. Usually, a day-long fast actually starts after the supper the day before. In other words, after this very meal that we've shared together. And then it goes through lunch the following day, that would be Good Friday, and we break the fast with supper on Good Friday. Not everyone can do a physical fast, um, but if you can, or if that's too much, would you consider fasting one meal or fasting something else like TV or social media for that period of time? The whole point is to always use that time to pray and pray earnestly. The information from the nomination on the website has good suggestions that will help you focus your prayer. And remember, I miss being with you. I miss seeing you. And we can't wait for the time when this is all over and we can see each other again. But for now, 
let's use this time of isolation to seek God and to grow together as families and to pray earnestly for one another and for our world. Before I go, just a reminder to the kids, if you haven't discovered it already, there's a great Easter-themed activity designed for you on our church website. I know you'll want to check it out. So, goodbye for now, and I'm really looking forward to gathering together with you in a couple of days so that we can worship on Easter Sunday morning together online. God bless you.